So if I was asked to ask you this morning, um, for 50 points, what name is the most common name used as an analogy for the Holy Spirit in Scripture? Who would say water? Any takers on water as an analogy? Um, any takers on wind? For the Holy, another analogy for the Holy Spirit? Any takers on the dove? Then, okay. Well, you're all wrong. Okay. None of you have got any points. Because if, if you'd said oil, Vili said oil, he's got 50 points because oil is the biggest analogy used, as the Holy, used for the Holy Spirit within the Bible. Have you ever thought about how oil was used in the Bible, in biblical times, or what picture it gives to us about the working of the Holy Spirit? Have you ever thought of it? I haven't. Never, I've never given the thought of, about it. But there are some wonderful stories within the Old Testament, that, especially ones that hold great instruction for us. And as, this morning, as, as our instruction from the Word, we're going to be looking at the, at the Holy Spirit through two Old Testament stories and the use of oil in those stories and what its meaning and relevance is for us today. How many of you think of uh, uses of the oil, of, of oil in biblical times? I'm not talking about sunflower oil or canola oil or palm oil. I'm talking about olive oil. They used olive oil back then. So, sorry? For anointing kings, yes. Yeah, anointing kings. Healing, yeah, it was used as a source, as a form of healing, of putting on wounds and that. Lighting lamps, yeah, that's a good one. Lighting lamps, especially where? In the temple. Especially lighting the lamps in the temple. What else? As an offering, yeah. Um, yeah, it was poured on the offering. It was part of the offering, yeah. It was used in the making of bread. A little bit of olive oil put in as it was being needed. There was, it was used as an anointment for hair and for skin. And, that, and, and as, yeah, as, as an anointing. You remember the story of Samuel when he went to anoint David, young David. He anointed him with oil as the future king of Israel. But in general, oil in the Bible is an analogy for the Holy Spirit because of the, the several properties that it has and the uses that oil has. So oil can lubricate, doesn't it? Oil can lubricate. And for us, there is little friction and wear among those who are lubricated by the Spirit of God. Oil heals, and it's used in, for medicinal purposes. So the Spirit of God brings healing and brings restoration. Oil lights when it's burned in a lamp. So where the Spirit of God is, there is light. Oil warms. In that, in that flame of the light, oil warms as well. So where the Spirit of God is, there is warmth and comfort. Oil invigorates when it's used in a massage. And so the Holy Spirit invigorates us in his, in, uh, for his service. Oil adorns when it's used as part of perfume. So the Holy Spirit adorns us and makes us more pleasant to be around. Oil polishes when used to shine metal. So the Holy Spirit wipes away our grime and, and smooths out those rough edges. Well, that's, you've got the, of what the oil is and what the Holy Spirit does. Already, I could just say, well, that's it for today. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do the benediction we can go home. But there's more to it. Absolutely, much, much more to it. But anywhere, any idea where the first mention of oil is in the Old Testament and in which way it's used? Okay, blessing. Any takers on the blessing? Well, there's a well-known story in the Bible, and it's an important time in the life of Jacob. Very important time in the life of Jacob. He's left his home in Canaan, and he's fleeing his brother Esau. You know, after that uh, deception that he had with his birthright and the blessing and that, and his dad says, listen, you better get out of here. You go, go to your mother's father, go to, your, go to the house of Laban, because your brother wants to kill you. And we pick up the story in Genesis chapter, verse, uh, chapter 28, and we're going to read from verse 10 through to verse 19. Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. 
When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway reaching, resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord God, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised to you. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I wasn't aware of it. He was afraid, and he said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Early the next morning, Jacob took the stone that he had placed under his head, set it up as a pillar, and poured oil on top of it. He called that place Bethel, although the city used to be called Luz. Thanks, Marilyn. So this is Jacob's first encounter with the living God. And the first instance of, of oil being mentioned in, in the Bible. So Jacob is on his travel, fleeing from his brother Esau. And he stops, and he's tired, weary, and he takes a stone, and he uses it as a pillow to go to sleep. You know, men were a lot tougher back then. Yeah, very much so, because I couldn't use a stone. But he falls asleep, and in, as he's sleeping, he has this dream. And in his dream, he sees this stairway that's going up to heaven, and the angels are ascending and descending up and down this, and the Lord God himself is standing at the top. And God assures Jacob of both his presence and the fulfillment of the promises that he'd made to his father, to the father Abraham and to his father Isaac. And when Jacob wakes up, obviously he's amazed. Now, I would be too. I don't know about you. After having a dream like that, especially when you've had your head on a rock, the most uncomfortable thing. But he's, he wakes up and he's amazed and he says, here I am and I thought I was alone all the time when actually God was in this place with me and I didn't realize it. And so then he takes this stone that he's been using as a, as a pillow and he sets it up as a pillar. And then he anoints it with oil. And then he renames this place Bethel, meaning the house of God. So what are we to make of this? Well, why rest your head on a stone? Why, after experiencing God, do you pour oil on the stone? Now, why, why do you set that, set that stone up as a, as a pillar or a sign to commemorate the occasion? Does this, the first mention of oil in the Bible, point to maybe something bigger? Well, if you look at the future events that's in, in Scripture about Jacob's life, there was a whole lot more that carried on from here. This was just the beginning for him. When God later called Jacob to return back to his, to his home after, after staying with his uncle Laban, this is how God introduces himself in Genesis chapter 31. He says, I am the God of Bethel, the place where Jacob changed the name to. I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed a pillar, where you made a vow to me. Now arise, leave this land, land and return to the land of your birth. It's already God's referring back to what Jacob had done. And when Jacob returned back to the promised land after being, from, being with Laban, we see in Genesis 35 what God told him. He told him where to go and, and what, he, what he was going to do there. And Genesis 31 verse, uh, 35 verse 1, Then God said to Jacob, Arise and go to Bethel and live there, and make an altar there to God. And then in verse 14, Jacob set up a pillar in that place where he, that's God, had spoken with him, a pillar of stone, and poured out a drink offering on it, and he also poured oil on it. Yet again, he's pouring oil on, this, on the stone at this altar. And then in his last days, as, as Jacob is coming to the end of his life and he's blessing all his sons, 
the blessing that he gives to Joseph, he, he describes how the Messiah would come from God. In Genesis 49, he says this, But his, this is Joseph's bow, will rem remain steady. His strong arm stayed supple because of the hand of the mighty one of Jacob, because of the shepherd, the rock of Israel. Rocks, pillars, pillows, hang on, uh, little lines, uh, little strings going from words and cross-referencing and things in your mind at this stage. Because there's a picture of God, of, of how, of, of this encounter that Jacob has with God in Genesis 28. And this experience that Jacob has with, with the, the God of Bethel is the rock of Israel. It's just as Jacob had prophesied over Joseph. In other words, in picture form, the stone that Jacob rested upon there in Bethel, the house of the Lord where the stairway to heaven is, is the Messiah Jesus. Not just some uncomfortable rock that he found, but it's the Messiah Jesus himself. And he is the one that we are to rest on. We're the one that we've, we've, we must take our rest on. Just as Jacob set, his, set this anointed stone as a pillar, so Jesus, the true anointed stone of Israel, was set up for everyone to see as a marker, as a remembrance for all. Paul writes in Romans chapter 9, verse 33, he says, as it is written, and he's quoting from Isaiah, See, I lay in Zion a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. And then Matthew 21, we read these words, He who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but he on whom this rock falls will be crushed. So if you fall on the stone, you'll be broken to pieces, but if the stone falls on you, you're going to be crushed. The reality is that all of us can find our rest in this stone, just as Jacob did. But Jacob rested and put his head on the stone. We too can find our rest in the stone. Or we can stumble over it and fall and be broken to pieces by it. It's our choice. But like Jacob, resting the whole weight of his head on this stone, we too can, can put our whole weight upon the stone with a capital S. We can put our whole, our whole selves on them. And find that that stone is going to hold us up for all of eternity. Not just for the rest that we want now, but for here and forever. And if we choose against the stone, well, we read what the stone's going to do. The stone will, will crush us under its weight. I recommend that we choose the former, that we choose the stone as be that, to be that place of rest, rather than a stone that's going to crush us. Because that, that, form of st that stone is going to become the stone that's going to soon strike the nations of the world. It's going to be that stone that is going to crush the nations of the world to dust, as we read in the prophecy in Daniel chapter 2 of that statue. It's that stone that comes, the one that was cut out of the rock, that stone that comes and destroys that statue that signifies all the countries of the world. So are you resting on that stone? You might say, yes, I am. I'm a Christian. I'm, I'm standing on the rock. But that's not what I asked you. Are you resting on the stone? Are you resting in him? Look at the, the world today. We've had this, this global pandemic of COVID-19 that sort of makes, a, makes a, an appearance again and then comes, goes back and backwards and forwards the whole time. There's this war between Russia and Ukraine that... Well, it's, um, it's got all the signs of escalating into it, something even bigger than that. And then there's this, this very likely coming worldwide shortage of food and commodities in that. So we've got pestilence, we've got war, we've got famine in less than three years. In less than, a, less than three years. 
it sounds a lot like what Jesus said the birth pangs would be before his return. I'm not saying Jesus is coming back now. I, I would I would be first in line if he did. You know, I would be get ready. You know, the, I said before the Superman pose, whoosh, up we go. You know, but it's, it sounds like it could be. But in the midst of all this turmoil that's going on in the world, are we able to rest in Christ? Are you able to rest in Christ? Are you able to rest on that stone? You know, among all the, the notifications that we see on news and the news feeds that we have and that of the disaster and the gloom that's popping up everywhere, and even in our own lives, the things that are happening there, can you rest in the fact that actually Christ is in control, despite what we see, that Christ is in control? Because he is. He is in control. You know, he raises up one. He puts down another. And his ways and his will are being fulfilled. But it can be scary when we only focus on on what is happening, what we see happening in the world. But our focus should be on Jesus as we lay our head on that stone, that solid, dependable stone. Because when you put your head on your pillow, you you want a good night's rest. And and I think we all do. We lie our heads down on that, that, that comfortable pillow to have rest. And that's what Christ wants us to do, to lay our heads on him, the rock, to have that that rest that we need. So what about the oil? Okay, we've done all that. Now we're talking about the oil. What about the oil? So after Jacob has set the stone up as a pillar, he's changed it from a pillow to a pillar, and now he's anointed it. This, in a picture form, but portrays the anointing of God's Spirit that would come upon the true stone. It would come upon upon the the Messiah. Because Messiah literally means, in Hebrew, anointed one. And we read in Scripture, Luke chapter 4, verse 17 through to 19, says, The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to Jesus. This is when he went to the synagogue. And unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is is upon me because he has anointed me. He has anointed me. He hasn't, that's not talking about us. I was talking about Jesus because the Spirit of the Lord has, he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then in Acts, We have it again, where they say, You know what has happened throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. Didn't just anoint him, just with a bit of water or whatever, but anointed him with the Holy Spirit and power. And how he went about doing good and healing all those who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. And so in Genesis 28, that first mention of oil, we have this passage that pictures the the anointing of the stone of Israel. That rock of Israel, the coming Messiah, Jesus, coming into the promised land. But the oil wasn't just limited to the, the greatest of all to the Messiah. In fact, it was also used to anoint the lowest. It was also used to anoint the lowest. The outcasts of Israel to cleanse them, to set them free. And that picture includes you and includes me in it. Now, Leviticus has some wonderful pictures and and instruction in it and some really horrific things too. But one of these, one of the concerns, one of these uh, pictures and instructions concerns the use of oil on healed and cleansed lepers. And all of the instructions concerning the lepers you can read about in Leviticus 14, from verse 1 through to verse 32. And it's packed with symbolism for the believer. But we're just going to concentrate on the part that's concerning the oil. So if you want to, you can go home this, this morning and read Leviticus chapter 1. Uh, 40, sorry, Leviticus 14 from 1 through to verse 32 for yourselves and see the whole thing. 
And in this passage that, we, that is going to be read to us now, the, with beforehand, the cleansing process goes for seven days, from day one through to day seven. And then the leper is presented to the Lord by the priest on day eight. And this is where the oil comes in. So Marion's going to read now. From Leviticus 14, verse 10 through to verse 18. <clears throat> So on the eighth day, he, the leper, must bring two male lambs and one ewe lamb a year old, each with no defect, along with three-tenths of an ephah, which is about 6.5 liters, of fine flour mixed with oil for a grain offering, and one log of oil, about half a liter. The priest, who pronounces him clean of leprosy, shall present both the one to be cleansed and his offerings before the Lord at the entrance to the tent of meeting. Then the priest is to take one of the male lambs and offer it as a guilt offering, along with that log of oil. He will wave them before the Lord as a wave offering. He is to sort slaughter the lamb in the holy place where the sin offering and the burnt offering are slaughtered. Like the sin offering, the guilt offering belongs to the priest. It is most holy. The priest is to take some of the blood of the guilt offering and put it on the lobe of the right ear of the one to be cleansed, on the thumb of his right hand, and on the big toe of his right foot. The priest shall then take some of the log of oil, pour it in the palm of his own left hand, dip his right forefinger into the oil in his palm, and with his finger, sprinkle some of it before the Lord seven times. The priest is to put some of the oil remaining in his palm on the lobe of the right ear of the one to be cleansed, and on the thumb of his right hand, and on the big toe of his right foot, on top of the blood of the guilt offering. The rest of the oil in his palm the priest shall put on the head of the one to be cleansed and make atonement for him before the Lord. It's easy to read scriptures like this and think, well, that's pretty odd, and then just carry on reading, not thinking any more uh, about it. But there's, as with all scripture, there is nothing random about it because it all comes from the mind of God. There is significance in every single thing. And God knows exactly what it means. And this passage is not only for, for the lepers of days gone by, but it's for sinners throughout all ages as well. It's got significance for us. Because in the, leprosy in the Bible is, uh, symbolizes sin. And lepers were unclean. They had to live on the outside of the city. They had to, there was like a little colony or so outside the city where they had to stay. They weren't allowed into the city at all because they were unclean. Lepers point to sinners. And the cleansing of lepers speaks of salvation. Not only salvation, but the cleansing of sinners as well, like us that, we've, that we have in Jesus. And the lepers' cleansing was completed on the eighth day. And what happened on the eighth day? That was the day that Jesus was raised from the dead. On the eighth day. The beginning of the week. So on the eighth day, the, the, priest, uh, the, the leper was presented before the Lord. And on the eighth day, Jesus was raised from the dead. The beginning of the week. And it's his resurrection that enables us to have a new life. As we've seen over the last few Sundays. And here in this, this passage in Leviticus 14, the leper was cleansed through the sacrifice of a lamb, which the priest was, would wave before the Lord as an offering. The sinner is cleansed through the sacrifice of Jesus, as Jesus was lifted up on the cross before God. Oh, wow. Such... Such significance in Old Testament. And they say, well, oh, the Old Testament is just an old history and things. You don't need to read it. But there is so much there. So much relevance for us today. And then there's these two things that are applied to the leper as to complete their cleansing. There's the blood from the sacrifice, and then there's the oil. And it's got to be in that order. First the blood, and then the oil. And the blood is obviously symbolic of Jesus' sacrifice, because the lamb had to be sacrificed to get the blood. 
Jesus had to be sacrificed to allow his blood to cleanse us. And as we've seen, oil is an analogy of the Holy Spirit. And this is the gift of God at the point of salvation, that we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And both the blood and the oil were applied to the right ear lobe, the right thumb, the right big toe, and then the oil, what was left in the priest's hand, was poured on the head of the leper that had come. And we'll see about those, what those mean just now. But this, I want to end this section now. We're going to sing, uh, we're going to sing Majesty now. But just to end here, that we need to remember that God is showing us in, God's giving us an illustration in this cleansing of the leper, a picture of redemption and and sanctification for us. The leper, the sinner, has to first be cleansed by the blood, by the blood of Jesus, and afterwards anointed with the oil of the Holy Spirit. So it, in this picture form that we have, it shows us that even the lowest of the low, those outcasts, the lepers, were allowed to come into the body of Christ. We are allowed as sinners to come into the body of Christ and to receive the greatest of the great gifts of all, salvation and the Holy Spirit. So now when you get to the New Testament, when you get to the New Testament, we read about the spiritual reality of, the, of this anointing oil for us as believers today. And the words anoint and anointed and anointing aren't exclusively for Christians in the New Testament. But there are two or three very clear references that, that, that give us, that show us that it's the gift of the Holy Spirit that when we have been anointed with that when we come to Christ, we're given the gift of the Holy Spirit in that anointing. And one of them is what Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. He says, Now it is God who makes both of us, uh, both us and you, stand firm in Christ. He anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us, and put his Spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. What a wonderful passage. That he has anointed us and he's put, us, put his spirit on us. He's put that seal of ownership on us. So if we look back to the first mention of oil in the Bible. Jacob comes and he anoints this rock and sets it up. And it's a picture of the anointing of the rock of Israel, the Messiah. But we also see that in the anointing that was done to the lepers that... It, it was put on them as part of their cleansing process. And this in, in typology speaks of the cleansed and the redeemed sinner where the lowest of low, like you and I, are set free. But we're set free. Jesus the Messiah is also the true house of God. He is the true Bethel. And he is also the stairway to heaven. He is that, that bridge between heaven and earth. And that's why Jesus alluded to that, in, uh, to, to Jacob's dream and applied it to himself when he spoke to Nathaniel back in, in John chapter 1. Where, and Jesus says to Nathaniel, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see the heavens opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Alluding back to what had happened with Jacob. Remember when, as, as we ended the, the other part, the, the first part, that where God told the priest to anoint the, the lepers with the oil in that passage from Leviticus. You know, the, you've got to put it on the right earlobe, or they've got to put it in their palm, in their right forefinger, they've got to put it on the, the lobe of the one to be cleansed, on the right earlobe, and then on the right thumb of his hand, and on the big toe of his right foot. While the rest of the oil that was in his hand, he was to pour over, the, over the, the head of the one to be cleansed. So the oil went on the ear, the hand, the foot, and what was left on the head. What was God showing in this application? Because when you read it, you know, it's a bit arbitrary. <laughs> but what was God showing and what is the application? See, the anointing of God's Spirit should would be on these particular areas for good reason. 
And the ear is really, really important because that's the first place and it's there for a reason because it speaks of hearing what the Spirit has to say. You've got to hear what the Spirit has to say. Everything starts there. We listen to God's voice because it's, it's, it's so important when we go through our day. We've got to listen to the voice of God. And even more so nowadays with things that are going on. Lord, what are you saying to me? How are you? Lord, encourage me. I hear those words of encouragement that you speak to me. You remember when we did the, set, the letters to the seven churches in Revelation? What is at the end of each of those letters? What words are written? He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who has an ear, let him hear. So if you're a believer in Christ, then you are part of the sheepfold of God. And the sheep, as we know, knows the voice of the shepherd. We've seen, I've seen things on YouTube so many times where somebody, some foreigner comes along and tries to corral the sheep and they don't listen. The shepherd comes and he just has that certain tone and the whistles and, and commands and those sheep are just, they just do what he says because they know the voice of the shepherd. As you pray, what is the still small voice of the Spirit saying to you? As you read God's word, what is he placing on your heart? If your heart's worried, maybe he's saying, well, don't be worried. Don't take heart. You know, believe in me. Maybe he's saying that you need to share the good news. Maybe he's saying that you need to forgive a person that's hurt you. You see, our time with the Lord is crucial. It's critical. And are you listening? Are you listening? And when you, when you talk to the Lord, do you expect a reply? And so often we come to the Lord with a shopping list and then we walk away. Instead of waiting, Lord, I'm waiting. Speak to me. Do you set time aside to listen to what the Spirit is saying to you? So that's the ear. What about the hand? Well, the hand speaks of our work in the Lord as we've been anointed by God's Spirit. And the scripture says in Ecclesiastes 10, uh, 9 verse 10, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. And not just the things that you do yourself, but the, th the things of the Lord as well. Do it with all your might. And the foot, well the foot speaks of our walk. It's walking in God's ways. It's walking in the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5 verse 16 says, But I say, walk in the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. And the head? Well, the head speaks of our mind. We no longer think like we used to, because we now have the mind of Christ. We now have the mind of Christ, and we're renewed by what God says. Paul says in Romans chapter 8, For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. And then he carries on in, Romans, in chapter 12, verse 2. He says, no, don't, be, don't conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So we've got to hear. We've got to work. We've got to walk. We've got to renew all the places where the priest anointed the leper. When we come to Christ, we are anointed with the oil of the Holy Spirit as he touches us, as he touches our ears so we can hear, as he touches our hands so that we can do the work of God, as he touches our feet so we can walk in the ways of the Lord, as he touches our minds so our minds become renewed with the things of God. We see that the the oil of anointing of the Holy Spirit is, is not just for the greatest, for the Messiah, the Rock of Israel, as a symbol of his royal priesthood, but it also stands for the lowest, for the sinners, those who come to him, him in, in repentance and, and receive that free gift of eternal life and that free gift of forgiveness and that are cleansed by the blood. 
and then anointed with the Holy Spirit to hear the voice of God, to be the Savior's, to do the Savior's work and to walk in His ways and to have the mind of Christ. The leper wasn't immediately anointed with the oil. He was first touched with the blood. His hearing was cleansed. His hands were cleansed. His feet were cleansed. And then he was anointed. And so when we come to Christ, we are cleansed first and then we are anointed with the Holy Spirit. So let us approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we can worship the anointed one who died for us and through, who through the, the anointing of his Holy Spirit on each of us that we may listen to what the Spirit says to us, that our minds may be renewed to think the things of God and to understand the things of God, and that we may be the hands and feet of him who brings good news. Amen. Heavenly Father, there is so much that we can learn from your word. Yeah, we often read the, the Old Testament stories as just that stories. But you've put them there for a reason. And Lord, we thank you that by your Holy Spirit, you open up your word to us. That you show us these, these wonderful things, that a foreshadow of what is to come. But Lord, as Jacob rested on that rock, may we rest on you, the rock of Israel. As he anointed that rock and set it as a pillar. Father, we know now that that anointing is significant of Jesus being anointed by you. That as he, as Jacob stood the pillar up, or stood it up as a pillar, that that pillar is Jesus Christ as he stands for the world to see. The anointed one of God. And through the lepers, Lord, we We've read it many times and wondered, well, what on earth does this mean? And we just read over it. But Father, in that, we see the message of salvation. How your son's blood cleansed us. As we were outside of the city, as we were outside of the body of Christ, we are cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. And once we are cleansed, we're brought into the body of Christ and we're anointed with the Holy Spirit to hear, to work, to walk, and to be renewed. So, Father, as we go from here today, may your blessing and anointing of the Holy Spirit go with us. May we remember these things as we go into the world to make a difference. In Jesus' name, Amen. Mm -hmm.